Okay, thanks for joining us today. We're just gonna give it another minute or two for some additional people to join us. Okay, thanks for joining us today for our webinar, Preparing for Ontario's Upcoming Web Accessibility Requirements, AODA, presented by Open Insight Improve. Today, our subject matter experts are going to be Jennifer Chadwick from Site Improve. She's their lead accessibility strategist, as well as Rune Nielsen, a product owner at Open. I'll hand it over to them to introduce themselves. Sorry, I'm still muted. Okay. Um, Hi, Jen. Can, hear, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, everyone. Seems like we have some technical difficulties. Uh, Jennifer, can you hear us? Sorry, it appears we're having um, a technical difficulty. Jennifer, can you hear us? Uh, Julie, I'm just confirming I can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me as well? Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, um, while we're just trying to get set up with uh, Jennifer's mic, um, I think we'll just skip to the next slide and I can just my, introduce myself. Sure. Um, so Julia. so uh, I'm Rune Nelson. Uh, I'm happy for everyone to join here today. Um, it's very exciting. Um, I have been in software development for the past seven years, um, working in, in a couple of different roles. Um, started as a uh, software and usability tester in IBM Denmark. Um, then I spent uh, some time in um, Cisco's enterprise architecture team um, in Krakow in Poland. And um, back in 2015, I moved to uh, Toronto, Canada and worked as a business analyst slash product owner with a um, small software company um, building, um, building out their cut solution. Um, over the years, I've, I've, as I said, been working in, in different roles, as you can see. So it's all been focusing on software development and like web development, uh, focusing on like close interact interactions with uh, clients and specifying requirements, and um, specifically in regards to. Um, accessibility. I've been working hands-on with um, a couple of federal and uh, governments in terms of their style guides, um, 
continuously making sure that the requirements and designs uh, match the, the best practices. Um, at the same time, um, focusing here at Open on um, enforcing our accessibility practice and growing it as well. Um, so that is why I'm, I'm here, here today. Um, okay, maybe now we can circle back to Jennifer. Jennifer, are you there? Julie, I wonder if we should um, try and start the, the Zoom link again, um, since mm -hmm. everything was working fine before we started the, the, the call. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Just give me a minute. Okay. Jennifer, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so we're just going to stop the, uh, the Zoom link and we're going to start it again, I think. Hi, everyone. Oh. Um, sorry, can everyone hear me now? So I think they... Yeah, we can hear you now, Jennifer. It. Great. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, we'll just go back and introduce you now. Great. Do you want to talk about some of your experience? Sure, yeah. So I'm Jennifer Chadwick, um, the lead accessibility strategist for Site Improve. Um, I, my background is in user experience and inclusive design uh, and a bit of development back in the day. Um, but yes, yeah, so for the past uh, sort of, you know, 13, 14 years I've been in UX and uh, the past several years um, focused on digital accessibility or including uh, persons with disabilities in, in the designs and conducting training. Um, and sort of process implementation with organizations that Site Improve and Open works with, um, just to ensure that um, accessibility is incorporated into um, the workflow, uh, your processes, and your plans. So that's that's what I do now. Um, I'm also um, sort of an active member of the W3C because um, I believe they have some really great resources. So uh, um, that we'll talk about at the end of the webinar, but. Uh, yeah, there's, um, I'm excited to, to talk through some of the things we're going to work on today. Awesome. Okay, we already went over Rune's experience. Um, <laughs> Great. So we're, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of what's on our agenda today. Um, our subject matter experts are going to go over what exactly is web accessibility and um, inclusive design and how accessibility of your site affects its visitors. Um, we're going to be talking about some of the benefits of making your site accessible to people with varying abilities and disabilities. Um, as some of you know, accessibility legislation in Ontario is changing, so we're going to be discussing some of the specifics, um, what you need to know to comply by the 2021 deadline. Additionally, our subject matter experts um, will walk you through the steps you should be taking to building your accessibility roadmap while helping you understand um, some of the different roles and responsibilities um, of accessibility within organizations. So please feel free to ask us any questions throughout that you might have. Um, We'll be doing a Q&A at the end of this presentation. Um, we're hoping to get to all of your questions. If we're unable to, we'll send you an email separately, um, providing you with an answer. So let's just um, jump into things. Um, we're gonna start with a quick poll. Um, how prepared is your organization for web accessibility compliance? So we'll just give you a minute or two to make your selection.
Okay, so it looks like we have um, some varying results. Um, I think now is a good time for me to hand it over to um, Jennifer and Rune and we can get into um, accessibility and compliance and sort of preparing you for becoming compliant. Great, thanks for the, uh, there was some quick responses on the poll. Um, so yeah, what we're gonna start with is what is web accessibility? So what web accessibility is, um, it just means that, so all web content is accessible, um, meaning it can be uh, perceived, which means sort of actioned upon, um, understood technically, and uh, the message is getting through, so perceived, um, operated, um, you know, interacted with and, um, you know, successfully and understood, meaning the content and the context is fully understood um, for websites and mobile applications uh, without any barriers uh, by people of all abilities and disabilities. So the user experience um, that you have with a, a website or a mobile application or a document, we just want to make sure that um, these things are also accessible um, to everyone, regardless of uh, ability or disability. So we'll talk about the, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, on which the AODA, um, or the Ontarians uh, Disabilities Act uh, in Ontario and other laws, um, have adopted. So WCAG um, defines web content as uh, those things that I mentioned, so web pages on desktop and mobile devices or responsive sites, uh, web-based applications and software, whether it's customer facing or internal, um, just about everything. So text, links, images, forms, or any other sort of interactive content um, that you'd have on a page is also uh, defined as web content. Um, documents as well, so PDFs, uh, Word, Excel, uh, PowerPoint, anything that can be downloaded from your website is also falls under WCAG or is part of web content. And of course, then you have, you know, interactive things like video, audio and animated files. So we just want to make sure that we're clear as to know what we're talking about and what's covered under law and covered under the guidelines. So um, then we'll sort of move into, um, yeah, the, the laws that we have in place now in Ontario and other provinces, but also, as Julia mentioned, we're going to talk about um, the ACA or the Accessible Canada, uh, Canada Act that was just passed. So the importance is to know that there are deadlines for AODA, which we'll talk about, um, and those are, you know, changing those this, this upcoming regulations as well. So the AODA, uh, was passed in 2005, um, and it's a what we call a human rights law or a civil uh, civil law that protects the rights of persons with disabilities to have equal access to um, information, education, um, you know, being able to work and to contribute and sort of um, uh, successfully uh, be part of of society in those ways um, through obviously not only the built environment through um, you know, physical accessibility spaces, but also uh, it also includes web, disability, uh, web accessibility. So there are five regulatory standards that cover these things, uh, customer service, information and technology, employment, transportation, and design of public spaces. So the goal is to be barrier free, meaning that everyone can access a building but also access web, um, web and mobile devices and, um, and do so freely without any technological or societal barriers by 2025, and that's the goal. So as I mentioned, there are other provincial laws that are not as mature as, there, as the AUDA, but um, Manitoba is probably the, the most mature. Um, then BC has developed um, an act. Uh, Quebec has an act um, for their own government. Uh, Nova Scotia is coming up um, quickly behind. And then as I mentioned, there's the Accessible Canada Act, which we'll get to in a moment. We move to, yes, yeah, specifically the website requirements. So this is interesting. So the AODA, is actually sort of globally recognized, especially in the States and uh, in the UK and Europe as, because it's one of the few accessibility laws that actually cites the ISO standard of WCAG 
um, as the requirement for web accessibility. The ADA in the US does not call out web accessibility or doesn't sort of clearly define it based on the, uh, the guidelines. So we have a really strong, um, strong law and we have an enforcement through the regulation um, through WCAG. So what you need to know is um, by, as of sort of January 1st, 2014, um, all new public websites, significantly refreshed sites or sort of any, any web content that you posted after, um, after 2012 must meet um, WCAG 2.0 at level A. So there are three levels of WCAG um, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions about the specific sort of differences and importance of that. But there's uh, level A, double A and triple A. So what we're saying is that any public websites uh, within your organization that you have all that web content on must have been, um, must be, you know, applicable or so it must be compliant with level A as of 2014. And this is the you know beginning of uh, 2021. Um, it's now double A. So this is a, a lot of organizations have this in mind, and this is the goal they're working towards now. So um, yeah. So who must comply with the the AODA? Well, uh, public, private, and nonprofit organizations uh, with 50 or more employees must all comply and make sure that their public websites and property, digital properties, as we mentioned, are compliant. So I've, I've made a list here, um, municipalities, government ministries, hospitals, schools, uh, stores, restaurants, retail, um, whether it's bricks and mortar, um, and you have a website for your dental office, or if you're solely, you know, you're you're selling products and services online completely. Um, just about everyone has to um, abide by the rule in Ontario. So we also talked about one thing that's that's quite exciting um, and a long overdue, which is the Accessible Canada Act, or Bill C-81, which was passed in June of this year. And it's a milestone because it takes all the good stuff about the AODA, the um, the you know upholding uh, people's rights within Ontario, and now federally, you know, all across all provinces, the right to access information, the right to participate in society through work, um, uh, education, um, you know, uh, being consumers, all that stuff, that, that, that inclusion of people in society is the goal. And now our government, um, the government of Canada has now said to, um, said to itself that it must abide by the same rules. So it's updating its own websites, it's updating its own um, policies to ensure that the employment rate of people, persons with disabilities increases and people are, you know, there are incentives for companies to make their, um, their workplaces more accessible and inclusive uh, so everyone can get ahead, which is really, really exciting. But in terms of a legal perspective, um, there are certain regulated entities from the government that must abide by this Accessible Canada Act. So that's the government itself, uh, the transportation industry, broadcasting and telecoms, uh, banks, banks and financial institutions, uh, Crown Corps, the military and police will now um, fall under this new, the new act and this new sort of standard. So what's What's great is that there's an accessibility commissioner that will be appointed to help the minister in charge of this this act, and also you know to sort of regulate and enforce it in a in a bigger way than uh, than than now. So there's a mandates and there's an attempt to cease violations, but also provide grants and contributions and incentives, as I mentioned, to to companies. Um, you know, and businesses in Canada as well. And the one thing that we, we love is that uh, WCAG is also included in this. And the understanding is that it will, um, the ACA will adopt uh, 2.1, which is the latest version of WCAG. So whereas the AODA calls out 2.0, and again, um, more than happy to answer questions about what's, what new uh, guidelines are included in 2.1 after the call or, or, um, or on, our, on our call. But yeah, that's exciting stuff. Um, Rune, uh, do you want to talk about the, the common challenges and myths uh, about digital, digital accessibility that you've come across? And we also have another poll. And we have a quick poll, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, let's start off, off with the poll because it's a great segue into like the next couple of slides as well. So we'll just give you a minute or two to answer the, the poll quickly.
Mm -hmm. Okay, it looks like we have some um, different results here. So we'll, ha we'll hand it over to Arun so he can sort of um, demystify some of these uh, barriers. Yeah, this is perfect. Um, see the results just uh, disappeared from my zoom link here but it's definitely uh it's definitely interesting to see um how the uh, answers kind of align with my own personal experience um working like across three different di different countries so uh one of the one of the myths that i hear a lot is that it's it's not that important to like change our designs or rethink the way users interact with our website because we're only changing this for the one percent, and um, it's that in itself is is like a flawed statement because it's been estimated that up to twenty percent of the world's population has some form of a disability. Um, so right now, I, I don't know where we're all located, but at least in Canada, um, it's estimated to uh, almost three million Canadians have identified having some sort of um, disability. So. Even there, like looking just at some of the numbers, it, it's, it clearly stands out that this is not just for the 1%. Um, it is for a lot, um, it's for a bigger, bigger population. And uh, if we kind of take a step back and look at society and where we're going, it's, um, it's evident that we're going to be using technologies, um, websites, apps, in like a lot more in the future. And um, looking at like where um, our population is going, it's, it's aging a lot faster. There's a lot more um, cognitive issues and like kind of combining like the, the trend of our population itself with, um, with how reliant we are on technology, that kind of gives an indicator that this is just not for the 1%. It might've been the 1% a couple of years ago but moving forward five, five to 10 years, it's gonna be a lot more than just the 1%. So getting like your whole company ready now is gonna allow you to um, tap into these like almost 3 million Canadians. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So the next one is, is really in terms of return on, in, on investments. It doesn't make a difference. Um, people can see like the extra money that they have to put down for um, extra designs, um, for the extra uh, consulting fees, for instance. Like there, I, I hear it a lot that this doesn't really make sense looking at numbers. Um, again, here looking at like the actual facts, um, it's been estimated that 1.5 billion people worldwide has some sort of uh, disability. Um, looking at these on a more um, hands-on number, that's, that's one in every five people. And uh, kind of tying that into actual dollar amounts, um, we're looking at a 1.2 trillion in buying power. So if, if your um, corporation is thinking that you're only designing for 1%, doesn't have an impact on my um, um, uh, uh, ROI, then looking at like these facts here, you, you're kind of missing out on a 1.2 trillion, um, uh, trillion pool of money. Uh, not saying that you're offering service to the whole world, um, but it kind of gives them a, a kind of a, a, a different view that this is not just the 1%. Um, if we're looking at the users with um, some sort of impairments, their um, buying behavior is a little bit different from uh, people without um, disabilities. Um, people without disabilities will typical, typically just buy products based on um, like the features. They will go to a website because they know they have all the products that they want. But 80% of the internet customers with impairments will actually uh, spend their money on websites that are easier for them to use and not necessarily focus on like the cheapest products. So um, it, it's kind of interesting that we have to change the way we think that it's not just a matter of having the cheapest products or the products with the most features. It's really about like how easy is it for people to navigate on our site, to see all the content, to tap through the site. 
um, that's really what's driving um, what's driving that type of, of behavior. Um, myth number three is that it costs too much. It's too time consuming. It requires a lot of resources. And this is something I've seen in the past as well. And this is something that a lot of research is also validating that it takes about the same time to fix a website that's already built. Um, so it takes about the same time and money to fix that after it's been built as it does to just re rethinking and thinking accessibility into it from the day one. So if you have the, the tools, the, the practices, the people, the, the kind of process in place, um, then you're going to save a lot of money in, in the long run. And um, at least one of the items that we do at Open is that we make sure that accessibility is part of our definition of done. So um, moving into like the second column, when it comes to like writing requirements, we make sure that, that, no, that there's nothing that gets shipped to our clients that doesn't uh, comply with um, the v, uh, WCA. Uh, double A. So that's one of the things that we have in our um, definition of done. So for the audience here, it's really like writing your requirements, training your, training your staff, um, potentially finding new resources or upskilling your, your employees, um, making sure that you have the right tool sets and maybe even looking at your existing code bases. Um, that's often like half the time and like have the money that it could take if, if you were to correct the site after it has been launched. So it's, it's really trying to get away from this like almost panic mode that, oh, our site is not accessible. It's gonna take so much money to, to fix it. And, and moving forward, it's, it's really about making sure accessibility is important from, from the uh, first day. Move on to the next slide. Uh, I think Jennifer here, this is a great segue into your uh, good and bad experience. <laughs> yeah, so another myth is that, you know, accessibility has no effect on how people see our brand. Um, and a lot of the times, and it's understandable, many organizations really haven't thought about persons with disabilities as being part of their consumer base. But as we know, they they are. And they're very, like, as, as we mentioned in some of the statistics we found, um, they're very loyal once they do find you as a differentiator of your site is accessible accessible, they will be, and I've heard this from friends uh, in the community, they'll be uh, consumers for life or they will, you know, gravitate towards you. And that's, that's, that's fair. So the iOS Press uh, did some research to find that 87% of customers prefer to give their business to companies that hire individuals with disabilities. So what we were talking about in moving the dial um, within Ontario under the AODA or the new ACA, um, the Accessible Canada Act, where you have people who are highly, you know, talented or have unique experiences and diverse abilities being able to sort of make sure their workspace and your website internally and externally is accessible to them and then hiring them. This is, this makes a big difference to people who, uh, who see your brand. If you're focused um, on accessibility, web accessibility and inclusion, um, you can see a significant, you know, change in attitude towards your brand. And the other thing is providing accessible products and services along with so the you know, ethical and respectful treatment of, of customers um, are two of the most important corporate social uh, responsibility issues. And this is found by Clickway Pound in, in the UK, but this is very prevalent in, in Canada as well. So I'd be more than happy to do a, a sort of a litmus test um, or you know, look into statistics done by um, uh, the ROI or return on disability um, team here in Canada. They, I think they're based in Ottawa actually, but um, they have really strong statistics and I think you'd see the same thing. Um, there's a real buzz and a real interest in, um, in accessibility in Canada, which is exciting. So this sort of just leads me to the next, uh, next slide, which cites the CBC amongst other large corporations such as Microsoft Google, uh, our own Canadian government, uh, Amazon, uh, BBC, um, 
and uh, obviously Apple has always led the way with the universal design for their products and Capital One, uh, a credit card company is making some significant gains. So in terms of how people see our brand, this, this demonstrates that there are organizations out there that are multi, multinational, with multi-departmental, with highly complex sites and products that have actually made this work. They've been able to incorporate, um, they have no excuses. It doesn't cost too much time, doesn't cost too much money. Uh, we're not just thinking about, you know, we're not just dismissing the 1%. They have successfully adopted web accessibility and uh, worked internally and externally with, uh, with stakeholders and their own staff to ensure that they've updated their processes, as Rune mentioned, and upscaled their, their staff, their responsibility, and their, and their processes to, uh, to make it you know, work and make themselves inclusive on a global scale. Yes, and then, <laughs> so those were the, that's, those are the examples of the good. And then unfortunately, due to a sort of a culture of fear uh, around lawsuits in the US, um, conversely, you've got a lot of organizations that have had lawsuits filed against them. And in Canada, it's a different story. There's, there's much more of a sort of a, a negotiation process before you, you get to get to the court, that's, that's for sure. But unfortunately, Target, um, after a major lawsuit, um, changed their processes significantly. Same with Walmart. Uh, and then Netflix, um, after someone mentioned they, you know, I'm, I have hearing loss, I can't, uh, there are no closed captions on your, on your content, um, made a significant change. eBay did the same to make their retail site more accessible. Um, and then we have, yeah, we have Beyonce because um, there was a woman who uh, was blind who wanted to purchase tickets to a Beyonce concert on the Beyonce website. It was an eight and one able to. So that um, that uh, that news story hit pretty hard. Um, so did, and I don't know if anyone's aware of this, but. Um, the latest ruling from the Supreme Court came down on Domino's Pizza, who actively fought tooth and nail uh, against the rights of, a, again, another a, a blind gentleman who simply wanted to order pizza online just like everybody else. And they argued against, um, against the saying it's not a civil right and uh, the damage just you know, to Domino's is kind of irreparable. It's just really the wrong way to go. Um, I think there are exciting and, and really really easy ways that you can uh, start to make change in your organization. And if, you know, someone like BBC or Microsoft or Google can make that commitment, um, that really does make a difference to your brand. So here are the facts. Uh, it's pretty clear that persons with disabilities use websites and mobile applications every day, as we do all. Um, they'll use assistive technologies such as a, a screen reader, or they may just use a keyboard or a switch control instead of a mouse to operate a site. Um, a screen reader will read out, reads out all the uh, the information on a on a site. Um, they may use a Zoom magnification software. If you have low vision, they may use um, other, other, other assistive technologies that have been built over the past sort of 30 years to accommodate people. So they're using this technology and interacting with your website. And so they're good to go. I mean, they have the right to do so freely without barriers and have equal access to information, products and services online, just like everyone else. So what we're saying is because they're equipped with this assistive technology and are active consumers, active consumers and, and sort of very tech savvy, especially with mobile and, and, and so forth. If your website or app is inaccessible, then a lot of times you're causing the barrier. And I know it's difficult when you work with a, uh, with a CMS that you can't control or legacy systems are very, <laughs> are, are, are gluggy and inaccessible. So we'll, we'll talk through how you can sort of work with them or work with that. But you, you are causing the barrier. A lot of the times people are equipped with what they need and then your uh, site is the last resort. So the good news is that these primary challenges to web accessibility, although some are technical, a lot are attitudinal and societal. So you have the a lot of people have the attitude that people with disabilities don't use sites, they 
don't really understand how how they interact with sites. So once you once you learn that and you sort of start to understand people's experiences and willingness to work with you, um, you have the power to remove that attitude barrier right now. And it sounds like a lot of people are doing that, um, and that's why we're here. So once those are removed, and you say, okay, these people matter. It's fascinating how they use a site. I didn't know that, and I want them to be able to use my site and access my products and information. Then once these, this sort of attitude is removed, then changes to policy and process will just follow naturally and easily, right? Accessibility compliance becomes part of every project. As, as Rune was saying, you, you bake it in, um, and then once you do that, there's some time cost and money um, sort of spent up front to do so, but then you equip yourself and you become an inclusive culture and an inclusive shop. So suddenly those constraints such as cost time uh, are really no longer an issue when you're building accessibility or web accessibility and as a business requirement. If we move on, yeah, building your accessibility roadmap. So that's what we're here for and let's get started. So I believe, um, yeah, this is, so this is something I pulled together after you know years of working with different organizations, and you may not have all these steps at your 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 organization. Um, this is an enterprise one. This is sort of you know multi multi departmental uh, with multiple content contributors and uh, multiple facets. So, but I think it's the same for whether you're small, medium, or large. But web accessibility starts with an adoption. So saying, okay, now we're going to we're going to be an accessible organization. Then you adopt and then you need to govern that or manage um, manage that throughout your organization to ensure that everyone is following uh, following this new this new goal. Then after that come you know with governments comes training to training your staff to upscale their skills um, or adding new resources or training everyone on the sort of end user experience. Then you start to design inclusively all the time. You're thinking, writing, coding, designing, developing inclusively. Then you get into that sort of development cycle. So you, you code your pages, you build, you, um, you produce um, new digital properties that are accessible. Then you might use a tool like Site Improve to scan those thousands and thousands of pages to find accessibility issues, um, common ones that you want to get rid of, or things that are recurring, you know, whether in your header, or your footer, or navigation, things that you know once you fix once can be can be updated quickly and easily. Then you want to conduct some manual testing. So as I mentioned, some WCAG guidelines are covered by automated. Most are covered by automated, and then there's manual testing with a you know test and validate with a screen reader, keyboard, zoom magnification, that kind of thing. Then you find those issues and then you work to remediate or fix them. And then you're testing and validating those things. You've got your definition of done, which includes all these things. And then you have a sort of an ongoing monitoring process. You're, you're being proactive um, and working closely uh, with your partners and stakeholders to ensure that this is now the new way of things and uh, those, you see those accessibility issues being reduced further and further over time. So if we just go through the each of those uh, steps. So as I said, um, adoption comes hopefully, and I've seen this, the most successful, this most successful stories I've seen with organizations is that from the top down, from the CEO or the executive management team down, accessibility has been staunchly set as a, as a pillar of their, uh, of their brand. So if you're doing, if you're, you know, working within your team to conduct a few accessibility audits or assessments or learning, learning either from outside the, you know, within the community or inside that there are issues, share those results with your EMT and identify those barriers that are causing, as we talked about, legal risk due to the law and the requirements of WCAG and AODA or reputational risk, which we talked about, um, and lost opportunities for revenue generation and customer retention. Then you go into governance. And one of the key things to do here is to create a company-wide mandate policy or standard. So are we a company that's going to say, we'll put our stake in the sand to say, we're gonna be a web, um, we're gonna comply with, we have a, an internal standard of WCAG 2.0 AA, 
before 2021. So by establishing that, it also means that you don't have to do it all at once. So when the AODA requires a compliance report every, every three years for, pub, uh, for private and every two years for public, I believe. So they understand that there's a multi-year sort of roadmap or plan that should be in place. So that's, that's how you establish that and ensure that very specifically, if you work with OPEN, you know that they're fully inclusive and they are working alongside you. But a service level agreement with any, uh, any vendor or of software or um, partner, digital partner, just make sure that the service level agreement also includes your, your standard so people know what measurement you're expecting them to face. Then training, so identifying current gaps in knowledge and practices right now within your team to equip them with the ability, the skills um, to make uh, things accessible. And then if you want to assign a, an accessibility expert within your team, that's an excellent way to spread the word and to have a go-to person. Either that or you, um, you work with a, you hire a consultant, someone like that to provide, this helps to provide guidance, obviously to start with, but also to main, maintain that governance. And then inclusive design. So you're writing, coding, and designing with accessibility in mind. And everyone has their role and responsibility to play. It's a great idea to create a, a pattern library, a code library, uh, and a style guide. And I think Rune's gonna talk about this as well. But um, if we go to the next slide, yeah, developing, retesting, and then doing that ongoing monitoring. But then we talked about as well, just building up that inclusive culture. So if you're unsure about how to fix something or want to complain about a, a certain system that's not uh, making it easy to be accessible, talk to someone about it, work together to try to overcome those challenges within the organization. And then also, uh, one of the ex sort of best ways to ensure that you're on the right track is to hire people with diverse experiences to either to be on your team um, or to, you know, as, as experts in, in testing and validating some of the, the changes that you've made. So be that difference to people's lives. It makes a big, big difference. So key actions. As we said, establish a compliance standard, decide what it is, WCAG 2.0 or 2.1 at AA or A, uh, AAA, whatever, whichever you want to, uh, to place. Then conduct an assessment of your current websites and documents and everything that you, that's downloadable from your site or accessible from your site or, you know, if you have a mobile app, all these sort of tasks that you can complete on there. Using automated tools, as I say, it's an excellent way to have an overview of all the issues and where they're placed on your pages, as well as manual testing against your new standard. Then update your content and practices. Up, you know, just get going, get started to, um, stop, stop creating barriers, see where they are and stop doing that practice. <laughs> Start uh, thinking inclusively and then continue, continue with what you're doing. And if you're doing something really well and you're being inclusive and doing this work in one area of your organization, then you can start to expand out to different departments. Uh, update your policies and service level agreements. As we said, include a def definition of done, your include your company policy and your business requirements. Make sure that um, compliance with your standard, whether it's WCAG 2.1, 2.0, whatever, is included in your business requirements. So it can't be de-scoped from any project. That was significant and in making sure that no one is sliding backwards and no one is forgetting about it. And also documenting things is incredibly important. And then identify knowledge gaps and create a budget um, budget plan for training, expertise, and tools. Uh, roles, responsibility, and actions. Rune, did you want to talk about this or we can share this? Yeah, absolutely. So um, by now we've kind of had a good overview of like the roadmap in terms of what are the different steps and activities we need to do. So this slide is really just talking a little bit about like who is then responsible for doing it. Um, again, it, it all depends on like where you're at in your, in your journey, uh, what size of your company, but these are generally like phases and activities that everyone will have to go through 
And as uh, Jen and Jennifer was, was um, talking about the adoption and governance and training is really starting from like the top level, your um, executive management team. Um, this doesn't mean that like the whole accessibility journey couldn't start from like the lower level. It just means that it's been proven to be more successful when it starts from the top. Uh, when it comes to like the inclusive design, well, it really starts with like the designers, the requirements that you write, um, the use of flow on your actual site, the content writer as well. Like, well, what are we doing as like a content team? How are we making sure that the content we're we're adding is is accessible? Do we check that our documents are accessible as well? Um, then it comes to like the marketing team as well. Again, depends on kind of like your your firm and like what business you're in. Uh, but these are typical like the the three key players when it comes to like the inclusive design. Then if we turn on to like the development um, and like the automated testing, manual testing, and like how to fix those issues, then it it's like it's a tight um, tight collaborative effort between your development team, your QA, and um, and depending on like if you have a partner company that's helping you, uh, it's it's a really tight, um, tight collaborative effort to make sure that you write your stories with accessibility in mind, you write your code with accessibility in mind, and you also test using uh, Site Improve or other different tools that you can use out there. Um, and then really, really forcing that ongoing monitoring. Um, it's it's only highlighted here is like the the QA and like the the testing tools and like the right column that's that's um, in charge of the ongoing monitoring. But it is really like the whole development team, designers as well. Um, once you have that tight group of people, then like accessibility becomes like something you're looking out for, and you want to make sure that every every line of code is accessible every uh page on your website is is um is um following at least like the double a as of uh, 2021 um so it might seem like there's a, a lot of different departments involved here but it is really the executive management starts it off and then it goes into like your your design content team and then your development team and like the last the last part of it with your developers and designers and QAs, they have to work really, really close together and, and recognize that this is something that's very, very important. Definitely. So um, there are a couple of web accessibility tips that I've picked up along the way that I like to share um, when working with teams. Um, one of the key things is demand more from your partners. And I think it was mentioned earlier, maybe in the chat, um, Chris, you said, you know, the CMS makes it difficult to, uh, <laughs> um, to make significant changes sometimes. I would say seek out digital software and service partners who have an accessibility statement themselves or demonstrated a commitment to delivering accessible products. If they don't, then it's kind of their onerous is on them to, to make those changes within the CMS, but you have a service level agreement with them saying, uh, our organization really requires uh, compliance to WCAG. And uh, if this is not something that you can deliver to us, then you might want to sort of reconsider that, that agreement. Um, so yeah, um, that's open provides this, they are a partner in it. And Rune talked about that really the importance of that sort of tight collaboration with everyone. But this is just one of those things that you, you can do, you can demand more by having a statement that says we are, we require compliance and that's built into your business requirements. Anyone who works with you or alongside you must, you know, it, it, it you, you risk, they, they put you at risk. Um, it risks redesigns and cause delays on both sides and it's just not, uh, just not worth it. So something to think about when you are looking at your start, start and continue is also looking at who you're working with as well. Um, so we have, the other thing I was going to say is that uh, WCAG is not new. Uh, one Version 1 1.0 of the content guidelines came out in 1999. Many, many people have been working on this. Many organizations have learned a lot and made their sites accessible based on that. Um, the other thing is that you're not alone. <laughs> there are, uh, and yeah, if, we, if you don't mind, Julia, going back to the resources, um, 
yeah, if we go to back to the resources, thanks. Just to say that the WAI, or Web Accessibility Initiative, under the W3C, the W3C is that organization that um, created the guidelines, uh, created WCAG. They, and, and part of these working groups for a reason, which is that I, I really want to be able to push really helpful, accessible, and sort of um, clear resources and tutorials on how people with disabilities use the web. Um, how to design and develop with tips for writing, designing, and developing. There are resources out there if you're not, you know, actively talking about that with your, you know, with your digital partner. Um, WAI, I put this link in here. Um, I encourage everyone to go to it. The WAI has a, a bunch of perspectives videos. So this is just a series of videos that demonstrate how certain people use technology based on their, uh, their needs. So, um, that's really helpful to take a beeline directly to someone's user experience to understand how they interact with your site and learn you know what barriers would come up um Senate proof also has an accessibility statement generator um that was based in con that was pulled together in collaboration with the w3c um to say you can fill that out to to let people know that you're uh committed uh to accessibility and here are you know here's how accessible our site is at the moment, but that, that's up to you to decide. Okay, I think that brings us to the question period now. We're just about at an hour. So um, I know one question that I received was, um, how will intranet sites be monitored and um, how will they be notified if they have any compliance issues? And Jennifer, I think that might be a question for you. Sure, yes, yeah. so the, um, the good news is that, I'm sorry, the AODA follow, um, requires that public sites, it's sites that public facing websites are, access, are made accessible um, to AA by 2021. This comes up as well in terms of how um, intranets, intranet sites fall into that. Um, so what I was going to say is that if you have staff, um, everyone has a, a right, a, you know, a, a human right to be able to access information. So intranet sites, if you have anyone on staff who has accessibility uh, needs or will in the future, then they would, you know, the AODA would not cover that or monitor that, but rather if they have, they experience barriers in the intranet site, they can uh, file a complaint to the Canadian Human Rights Commission. So, and being proactive, obviously you wanna prioritize your compliance with AODA um, and getting your public facing sites up to, up to date. However, um, the intranet sites are just as important, but they, they would be lower priority on the list, um, if that makes sense. And hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. Um, okay, and now I have a question for that might be more directed towards Rune um, from the agency perspective. Um, what are some different technologies that agencies use when they're testing um, accessibility for their clients? Mm -hmm. Great question. So I think just taking a step back, like one of the things that we do at Open is that whenever we engage with clients, like from, from day one, we we ask them if they have any staff members on their site who has um, have any form of um, disability, because then we could kind of uh, get another level of testing. Um, there's only so much testing you can do with tools. Like the actual best testing is like the manual testing with um, a person with some sort of um, disability. Um, we use um, Site Improve, we use um, some other like in browser, um, tools, um, wave tool, uh, Pally, and then we, we, we really just uh, use our, our common sense as well. So when we, when people are onboarded in, in open, they go through training as well when it comes to accessibility. So it's something like everyone is aware of, regardless of you being a junior developer, senior, uh, senior developer. So everyone has like the same um, same kind of basis to, to look at code from. So, so testing, like in, in summary, is it, it side improved that we run very, very, very frequently when we're doing development. Uh, and then um, a couple of other like in, in browser testing tools. Awesome. 
there any more questions related to? Um, we're just about at an hour here, so I think that'll be it. But um, I do want to say that if you do, if you have any additional questions at a later point in time, please feel free to reach out to Jennifer or Rune. Their email addresses are right here at the bottom. And then my email address will be on the next slide. Um, I wanted to say thank you for attending our webinar today and thank you to Jennifer and Rune for providing such great insights for all of us today. And hopefully um, we can translate this into our organizations. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. And thanks Rune thank and thanks Julia. Thank you Jennifer. Thank you. Have a nice day everyone. Yeah, take care. Take care.